Welcome everyone to our latest NCAA Social Series. I'm Andy Katz. This is episode number 29. In our latest episode, I'm pleased to be joined as almost every week I am by Dr. Brian Hainline, the NCAA Chief Medical Officer. And we've got two incredible uh, peers of yours, Dr. Hainline, uh, on our show this week. Dr. Catherine O'Neill, an assistant professor at LSU specializing in infectious diseases at the LSU Health and Science Center, and associate professor at Duke, Dr. Cameron Wolf, another specialist in infectious disease. We are definitely going to get to vaccines, where we are, what could happen uh, here momentarily. Um, first, though, Dr. O'Neill, I want to bring you back um, to March when this all started. Uh, and um, you were at a news conference, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe with the governor. And um, at that point in March, you did say that most of us will become infected. Um, you know, that was March. Where are we now in terms of the general population with 7 million cases in this country, uh, over 210,000 fatalities? Where are we in terms of the general population getting infected, not you know being in trouble with it, but actually getting infected. Right, that's a great question. We've had some um, some recent data that's come out to help us answer that question. Um, there was a great Lancet article last week that looked at serum studies from dialysis units across the United States and confirmed what a lot of other antibody projected studies have shown, which is that for the most part around the country, 10% of the population of those areas that have been hit have become infected. There are definitely areas that are higher, like New York um, and Louisiana. Some of the areas in New Orleans had up to 17% of the people that were surveyed that have become infected. But overall, um, you, you're looking at about 10% infectivity so far. So still a, a really long way to go in terms of number of people at risk. Um, I mean, I don't, this isn't a number we want to get to, is it? I mean, how, how much infection do we you know, to sort of have to need to get through for this to sort of get through before we even get to a vaccine. Uh, we want to stay right where we are, right? We want to we want to limit the number of infections, and we want to reach herd immunity through vaccination, which is the only way to reach herd immunity. Um, and and that's going to take another several months, hopefully, if we get to vaccine. Um, and so for now, if we could stay at this percentage, I don't think we can because we're seeing different spots increase, but if we could say as close as possible, we, you know, we decrease our admissions to the hospital, we keep healthcare going in the, in the United States, and we keep people safe until the vaccine's available. So, Dr. Wolf, um, I talk to coaches and players, you know, all the time, weekly, uh, multiple times a week, and I can tell you, you know, one of the frustrating things that I hear is that, you know, they want to, they, 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 they want to be able to sort of get through the 14-day the contact tracing period, and if they're testing quite a bit, you know, how do we test out of that? And I know there's confusion at the college level when they see, and I don't need, you don't need to get political here, but just when they see, you know, what's happened at the White House and in the sports world, last weekend, New England Patriots, they have their star quarterback, Cam Newton, he tests positive, and yet two days later, the team is playing a game on the road against the Kansas City Chiefs. And so in the college world, that wouldn't happen if someone had test positive because of contact tracing. So how do we deal with these mixed messages on the college level when at the White House and in the professional ranks, they're seeing something else? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Andy. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's big differences in what different groups can do based on how that group moves and how they, how they test within that group and how they try and mitigate. So, you know, one of, the, one of the things that clearly happens within a professional league is that they are able to really secure in, in a very bubbled environment and have a much clearer understanding of whether or not their group of players have been around in, in, in broader contact. It's a bit more difficult in a college situation when almost all of us, even if we're moving our college into sort of uh, many online classes or Zoom lectures like we're doing here, um, there's still lots of extra contacts and, and, and connections between people and between individuals. And so having a positive patient, with, a positive athlete, sorry, within that um, group often has more implication on a college campus than it does in a, in a really controlled, tight environment in a, in a professional league. 
and the perfect example would also be the you know what the NBA was able to achieve in the in the bubble in Orlando, when they were rigidly adherent to keeping their group um, in complete isolation from everyone else, and in fact testing so frequently as to feel that they had a really good handle on when every potential transmission could have occurred, and were able to use that to sort of dissect back and then sort of limit the quarantine implications, if you will. That's just orders of magnitude more challenging on a college campus because, you know, frankly, our kids are also students here to learn. They're here for an educational purpose. They're here because they're, uh, you know, they've got multifaceted sort of an environment that they're in. And, and therefore, all of those little connections make that much more complicated. Dr. Hainline, I had one Big Ten coach tell me last week that when, well, assuming we're hoping a better situation, but obviously this is still pre-vaccine, in January, when students come back on a campus, hopefully, that he's more inclined to put his entire men's basketball team in a hotel for the rest of the season to do what Dr. Wolf is saying, to sort of control that environment even more. They're in virtual classes. Um, you know, how plausible is that actually on campus where they can afford it and can do it to really keep that population of high profile athletes isolated from hotel to practice, hotel to games? Right, so uh, Andy, the only way that would really work is if every single team that was gonna play one another, if they really created that, that bubble where they were just going from game to game, it's not as perfect as, as the NBA bubble or the NHL bubble, but um, so that's fine for that one team. But the, the other thing is when you're playing against a competing team, you know, you have to have the assurances that they've done absolutely everything right. And, and it would be, pretty difficult except in the very highly resourced schools to create a situation like that so so that's what we're up against and and you know i, I think when we're talking about maybe a, a big tournament the final four you 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 know you can start talking about a bubble but when you're talking about a competitive season and one school playing against another school traveling and and you know and and, and as, as cameron so rightly stated i mean the, these are students they're they're here to really learn and, 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 and part of the, you know, to participate in the social experience of what it means to be a college student. So it can be done, but for it to truly work, it would have to be done by every single team that's going to potentially play against each other. So one of the things before we move to vaccines, uh, Dr. O'Neill and then Dr. Wolf, um, LSU Duke, both are playing college football at this juncture. Um, obviously we've had a lot of cancellations, some postponements, um, not necessarily in the, uh, the FCC and ACC and any kind of widespread uh, aspect of that. Um, how would you assess the way it's going so far? Because football is the first sort of guinea pig before we get to the high profile men's basketball and indoor sport in late November. I think it's going very well, but our experience definitely mirrors the experience of the community and then the country at large. We. We came back to campus early. We had to teach everybody how to do things right. Um, we had some missteps. We had some attempts at socialization that didn't work. You know, we saw infections. We had to reteach and say, these, these aren't the things you, you need to do. And, you know, it only becomes real when you know somebody who's had COVID. And, um, and we watched that realization come to everybody, including our team. And so I think that, that now our, our team is really, um, is really solid. They've learned a lot of lessons. They've doubled down on what's safe and what's not safe, and they're teaching our other athletes who came back to campus later. It's, I think they have figured it out, but, um, but our memory of, of what to do only lasts so long because as Dr. Hainline said, college is a social activity. And so it is a continuous reminder. And, and I think as we get further in the season, that, that becomes a challenge. Um, there, there are just things college kids wanna do. And, um, and to maintain that safety, it's a, it's a really long journey and continuous education. College is a social activity, though, but so is all of our life, even as adults. And as we've had to adjust, I would put it that all of our athletes have had to adjust at just the same pace. And I, and I completely agree with Katie. When you, when, you, when you see a few cases on your campus and you have to adjust, um, the athletes have learned really quickly for us. Um, but I, I will also say that I, I think the other big lesson for us has been has been that there's no one solution that fits this. We have had to think really hard about our testing strategy, our, our isolating of, of infected and quarantining exposed individuals. We've had to get our contact tracing really down pat and very efficient and work really closely with our health departments in ways that we never had to. Um, 
and frankly, it's, it is a different experience for our athletes. Like they are, I would say they are proud of the fact that they have been able to be here and perform as a team where many frankly doubted that they could do it. Um, even within our own system, I think there were large doubts as to whether it would work. And yet they've, uh, they, they've really now, I think, been moving very efficiently as a unit. And as Katie said, are sort of proud of the fact that they can now teach their new colleagues who are coming into winter and, and spring sports how to do it well. It's been All right. A- uh, I, I want to shift to vaccines now. And if both of you um, can give me an update of where we are uh, in the vaccine development. And I guess we'll start with you, Dr. Wolf. Well, so, yeah, so it's, first thing to say is that this has moved at a, at a breakneck speed. So, you know, thanks to both Operation Warp Speed here in the United States as the federal sort of pathway that's helped vaccines move along, but frankly, also globally, I, I, you know, people see this as the, the path out of this. To go back to Katie's point early on, like we don't want to get to have to do this through natural herd immunity. We're at 10% at the moment. Herd immunity is felt to be somewhere about 70 for this illness. So there's a lot of people that we would love to be able to vaccinate. There are there are three vaccines that are that are clearly farthest along the development stage within the United States, at least. Um, two that use a completely different vaccine technique that we've actually really never used in human vaccines before. That's one. Um, by a group called Moderna based out of Boston and the second one by Pfizer. Uh, there's a third vaccine that's actually based as a sort of a um, conglomerate activity between the University of Oxford and a pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca. And all of those are in what's called phase three development. So they've gone through their preliminary safety. They've gone through studies looking at how well they stimulate your immune system. And now they're nearing the end of a stage which is designed to test them in a much larger group. So about 30 to 50,000 people for each of those studies to see not only are there, are there rare safety signals that we pick up when we vaccinate a lot of people, but then truly how protective are they? So how many people don't get COVID because of that vaccine? And that's, the, that's still the big unknown. They look like they're generating an immune response which is comparable to a recovered individual who actually had COVID. So that's a helpful sign to go, yeah, this probably is going to work. But until we see some really granular data, which we just don't have yet, about what's the reduction in the numbers of COVID cases, then that'll be the sort of ticket that I think groups like the FDA will be able to use to say, yep, let's put this out in production. You know, Dr. O'Neill, it's one thing to have 30,000, which I know is that that magic number in phase three, but it's not just 30,000 people. It really needs to be diverse 3,000 ages, genders, ethnicities, um, thick, healthy, and obviously you know, the, the, some are getting the vaccine, some are getting the placebo. Um, how successful is it right now creating a diverse pool within that 30,000? Right, so that's a good question, and we saw some um, discussion this week about difficulty in rolling minority patients into vaccine studies and how we're going to start to really push for minority patients being enrolled to finish that enrollment process and to really get those numbers because you you want a vaccine that's been tested on a broad population of ages of ethnicities of areas so i I don't want to vaccinate just in a place that doesn't have a lot of covid i don't want to vaccinate in a place that's had a lot of covid already i want to get a decent percentage of people from different parts of the united states too because one of the long-term things we're going to be looking at with this vaccine is how long is it protective so we want that vaccine to be spaced out throughout the US so that we can gauge that as well. One of the things that the FDA has recently said to us, which is I think been, um, had given us a lot of peace of mind is that they do want to see two months of data after that second vaccination. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are both the two shot series, and then they want two months of data after that second shot. They started giving the second injection in September. And so that puts us in November before we would have two months safety data And I think that that timeline is something that we're used to seeing, something that gives us a lot of peace of mind, at least that we're going to go out at least that far. Um, Some complications are seen in those first couple of months, and then some complications are seen a little bit later. So at least we're going to we're going to have several weeks of data to to two months of data. The FDA does meet with those uh, vaccine manufacturers at the end of October to go over some of their prelim data. But again, it would be November before they um, would have that two month data. I think the other big thing is that these vaccines, as they're studying them, they're making them so that that there is a cache of vaccination ready to distribute should the FDA approve the vaccination. 
uh, but that cash is not large. And so the vaccine companies have said, well, you know, we'll have a million doses and then we'll have 30 million by January. If we have two vaccine companies that are both approved, maybe we'll have 60 million, but we're still talking about 10 to 20% of the population. So by January, if we have that much, much vaccination, if we have two vaccines that come to market, you're still looking at who gets vaccinated first. It's gonna be those at most risk. Um, it's been thrown around and, and definitely um, the National Academy of Sciences has put out their own roadmap to vaccines and who should get it first. And that's nursing home patients, people at high risk, healthcare workers. Um, and, and then after that, really going into the broader portion of the population, that would be after January. That, that January dosage is just gonna cover those people. Dr. Haley, I'm gonna to get to you in a second about um, the patient's aspect, the patients with a C, not a T, uh, within college athletes and coaches. Um, but first, one other vaccine company, Dr. Wolf, if I'm not mistaken, correct me, please, you're the expert here, Johnson & Johnson, if I'm not mistaken, is that a one dose vaccination versus these other two, which are two dose? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So Johnson & Johnson have, Johnson and Johnson have a one dose vaccine. I'm pretty sure Novavax as a final American company is also a one dose um, course. They're just both a little bit earlier in the development phase. They're entering phase three, whereas the other groups are kind of coming out the back end of phase three. It may well be that in fact, I hope that we reach a point in 2021 where we in fact have multiple vaccine candidates approved and efficacious. And then I'll be glad to have the headache of which vaccine would be best for which person. Whereas right now, I'm just happy for any of them to get approved provided the safety and efficacy passes. So Dr. Hainline, um, you're on a million of these Zooms, you're talking to coaches and ADs, uh, and, and I hear the same thing of like, you know, when's it coming, when's it coming? You just heard a timeline that you know, we're talking about um, January for those high risk populations at the best case scenario that they would start getting vaccinated. Not, as you know, I know you're the experts here about when it actually is approved and we have one, but it's actually getting in the arm, probably not before January to that high risk. Um, how do you sort of put everyone a little bit more, you know, at ease in terms of, you know, that they're gonna have to be patient here. And we're gonna have to deal with the other ways to um, mitigate this virus in advance of a vaccine? Well, I, I, I say things to them that they uh, don't like to hear, Andy. So um, the, the first thing I say is, look, it's going to be a while and, and, and we would all be very surprised from the point of view of um, intercollegiate athletes being able to receive large scale vaccinations that that's going to happen anytime before uh, the summer or fall of 2021. So I first try to manage that part of the expectation. And then the other part of the unpopular message is I say, the still most effective way of mitigating COVID risk is controlling the behavior of everyone. And that if you're doing everything right, that's the way to mitigate the risk. You can be tested 10 times a day or you could be tested daily, but we, we know that that is not the way that you control COVID. It, it, it's by doing the right thing. Um, and, and, you know, you, we, we, but you throw in a couple of hopeful things that, you know, maybe before the vaccine, there may be effective treatments that, you know, could make this much less virulent for the population at large and, uh, or those that are higher risk. Um, and then I'll end with a message that's, that uh, it, it, it really sort of emphasizes what has already been discussed, that we're all striving for herd immunity, but the herd immunity parties are not the way to go. And, and, and so, um, that the coaches still must emphasize to, to their athletes and to really all of the personnel that they have to do the right thing. Trying to get the infection is not the way to go. We'll have a vaccine eventually, but look, we're already, you know, in many ways successfully playing football. We're looking for, you know, it's going to be a modified version of how we roll out uh, basketball. It won't be with all the fans and everything, but, you know, we're, we're reasonably optimistic we'll be able to do that. So let's look at the great accomplishments that have happened. We are moving forward. Be patient and be a great coach. And coaches, more than anything else, they're educators. They're, they're coaches at higher education institutions. Be an educator and make certain that your athletes are doing the right thing. And it's not just for themselves, it's for the team and really it's for society at large. So look, with, with, with Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Wolf, I'm not trying to compare Coach Orgeron and Coach K, uh, but you do have two high profile 
national championship coaches on your respective campuses. Uh, and I'm not saying in any way that they're pressuring you, but um, for athletes, and in the case certainly with Coach Orgeron um, at LSU, where a high number of those football players have had COVID um, earlier this summer, um, how do you educate the coach, the athletic director, the players, that we don't know how long you would be immune from it after you've re recovered, even if you were asymptomatic from day one. H how do you get through that so that they don't think, hey, I'm fine. I had it back in July. I'm good to go. It's a combination of things. I think, you know, with any education, and we, we see it in the hospital as well, because we've had a decent amount of staff who worked COVID who have been infected and feel very much invincible, and, and they're not. Um, and so how do, you, how do you convince people that there's still a risk out there? A lot of it is talking through it, education, and then some of it is just abiding by the rules. These are the rules. And if, we, if you want to play, if you want to play safely, if you want to get to the game and be able to continue, if you want to see the other sports succeed, we follow the rules. And, and I think from Coach O's perspective, he has been uh, very supportive of a rule-based program. Let's just lay it out there. Let's tell everybody what to do. Let's not second guess ourselves. These are the rules. Let's follow them. And that's been a breath of fresh air for me because it, it takes the pressure off. We don't make game time decisions with COVID. We follow the rules. And, um, and I think as long as everybody is level set in that respect, it goes very well. Dr. Wolf. Yeah. I mean, Coach K has been exactly, been very refreshingly exactly the same. Like I have, have never had any pushback in both, Kay and Cutcliffe on the football side and, and in fact all the athletics departments have been very clear to say for, for this to for this to work we need to keep our athletes safe we need to keep our coaches safe frankly because they are of an age and often have comorbidities when they are at more impressive risk and frankly and I don't think we should forget that we are in a community here we are we are we are the, the the sort of the caregivers to families when we look after their when they look after their students and and by protecting the athletes, I am protecting everyone around them. And so, you know, this is a responsibility for the entire athletics divisions, not just the, not just the young and, and generally healthy athletes who, you know, for the most part, won't have major complications due to this virus. Some do. And I think we still need to remember that, you know, there are cases that are now well described of cardiomyopathy. There are cases of inflammatory conditions which fall out from COVID, even for the most healthiest of individuals. So I've been um, pleased, refreshed, um, put, it my, put my mind at ease that everyone here, and in fact, the ACC in general who I've dealt with, have been very um, keen to be rules-based, safety-based, sort of cautious in their approach. And I just think you have to be. I, I'd add one more thing to what Brian very, very appropriately said when sort of putting a little bit of a pause on people's rush to vaccines. The other part of that is that even when a vaccine starts getting rolled out, that, does, that will not take away our need to keep in place all the same distancing and mitigation strategies for quite some time. For us to achieve an, a, 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 an amount of vaccination that approaches a herd immunity and where we expect COVID to fall away, that is going to take us months, even after a vaccine is released. And so during that phase, the, the importance of continuing masking, continuing all the different sort of mitigation things we've already learned, that is still going to be right up there, uh, just as important. So, Dr. Hainline, we've seen SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey come out this week um, with some pretty strong language, you know, that there may be some serious fines um, for the institutions if they do not adhere to the policies of masking on the sideline. Uh, we've seen plenty of coaches who love the chin strap, the chin straps for the helmet not for the mask. And yet they, uh, they still love to do that. They think they can't hear. I mean, I don't know, you know, if, if, if they should have a blow, blow horn, you know, where they can be, be heard. I'm seeing officials that still, I, I guess I don't understand if they have a microphone, why they can't broadcast through the mask, that they're still constantly pulling it down. Um, how much do you want to see other leagues follow that and get tough here and potentially find institutions if their coaches uh, and Personnel on the sideline cannot adhere to the simplicity of just keeping that mask on during a game. Well, Andy, first, I, I, I think I fully support what, what Commissioner Sankey did, and it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, and it's for many reasons. One is just at the basic level, it's the right thing to do. But the other is there's the optics of 
you know, what, what really is going on when, when you have young people and, and others who are watching a game and the coaches aren't doing what's right or the players aren't doing what's right. It, it, it just sends a message. And so, so I, I think it's a, it's a great thing that he's out in front of that. And let me just echo another point. So, you, you know, speaking of commissioners, I, today I was on a call with, with, you know, all of the division one commissioners. And, and prior to that, I was on a call with, with the, uh, the National uh, uh, Basketball Coaches Association. So, you know, with Coach Lee and others, and they're all deeply, deeply committed, in, in my opinion, to getting things right. And they, they, they're listening to how to get things right. So, so I, I agree with, with, with Cameron and, and Katie. You know, the, the coaches are on board. The commissioners are on board. Yeah, we want to move forward. And, and yes, maybe there's even financial reasons to move forward. But they're listening very carefully, and, 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 and they're asking for the advice. And, and, and they're getting, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, you go to a lot of these medical advisory group meetings, and you'll see the commissioners sitting in on it because they, they want to learn, and, and they want to then relay the message. So, so it's a good feeling overall. And uh, getting back to your point, I, I like the message. You know, Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Wolf, um, it's not just obviously on the field. It's in the stands. And obviously, there have been fans. Um, we've seen this last week, University of Georgia, uh, not a lot of masks, not a lot of social distancing. SMU kicked out its student section because of their behavior. And Georgia has now since said that they're going to, you know, obviously uh, come down harder on their fans. Uh, if you could start, Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Wolf, of if we're going to even allow fans, which obviously these schools have, how critical it is, the optics. Everyone watches it on television. For the fans, the students, the adults in the room need to listen to the correct protocols. I think it's I think it's incredibly important for a number of reasons, and I think that our job um, as task force members has been to help our schools figure out how to help people adhere to the rules. I, I've said this time and time again. As we go through this pandemic, we encounter new social situations we haven't been in, and we forget. We forget to wear a mask. We forget that it's not okay to stand up and scream at your team, right? Uh, when people are right in front of you, I, it's just, you, you put yourself in a new situation and there are new rules. So how as a school do we remind people? And that's one of the reasons that we started off so small in our capacity in our stadium. Uh, sh could we distance people by six feet and put in 50,000 fans? We could but it, it adds a lot more risk. And we knew that it would take a while for fans to figure it out. And so we, you know, we zip tied seats. We made sure people couldn't sit in places. We forced them to be six feet apart and it worked. And, and we were really proud of the efforts of our fans at, at the first game. But when we add more fans, we were, we we're going to have to go back through those mitigation measures. So it, it's very important for fans to stay six feet apart. It's very important to stay masked. It's our job to help them figure out how to do that. We cannot expect people to enter a new situation and it be a light bulb that they've, they've always known all their life how to go to a football game and comply with pandemic rules. We, we have to help them. And I think it, I'd add to that and say it's probably different for every sport, for every stadium. Like it is... It is a very different process to ponder how we fit people into Cameron Stadium, which by its very nature on the football, uh, on the basketball field here is a, is a tight, dense, hot, screamingly loud place, which in every other year works to Duke's great advantage. Actually, that's a perfect sort of environment for COVID in many regards. That's very different than pondering, you know, LSU's, I don't know how many people you can pack into your football stadium. I imagine it's 10,000. Um, it's a lot and it's wide open, right? So yeah. the difference too is inside versus outside environments. We take those very seriously. I think we've got to be honest about what we don't know. Um, and let's, t let's think about those CDC guidelines for a minute and, and the limits of where they, where they exist. We talk a lot about six feet and 15 minutes as, as a sort of a space and a time through which we think the COVID risk is high. They were designed for standard community interactions. They were not designed for me screaming myself hoarse in the middle of a basketball stadium as UNC and Duke are close in the, in the, in the second half. Um, like we have to be sensitive to the, to, the, to the fact that there are certain circumstances that we have not thought through and not encountered in reality yet and are going to try and get that as we go. We've not thought about, the CDC didn't think about a rowing boat when they, when they pondered that, 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 sort of those rules. They didn't ponder about 
asymptomatic testing when they design those rules. So we have to be very sensitive to the limits of what we know and what we don't know and learn as we go through this process. Um, be open about what we've done right and what we've done wrong. And uh, there may need to be adjustments as we go along. I've continued to tell my guys that. Well, that is a perfect segue. Uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I want to go back to Dr. Hainline and then I want your both opinion on this. This is what I get to ask all the time. When are we going to get an answer to this? Is that the CDC guidelines of not on, not on a positive test here. I'm talking about you're being tested every day negative and you have a contact tracing. The CDC guidelines, how, I'll ask you this again, Dr. Hainline, how much were these guidelines based on a population that could be testing as much as high profile college athletes every day or every other day? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you, you know, in some ways we're all figuring this out as, as, as we're talking, even like during the show, but so, so I'm, I'm on the phone with, with Cameron and Katie and, and, and other, you know, really uh, very, very smart people in this field. And, and it reminds me sometimes of, um, you, you know, I, I haven't done this in a few years I, since I became NCA chief medical officer, but when you're doing rounds, say in the, in the neural intensive care unit, and you have these guidelines for this and that, but you have this, you know, this patient and, and you have five people and you're, you're, you're sort of standing around and saying, you know, well, what do you think? Well, you know, this could work. And, and what do you think? And then two or three people say, you know, why don't we try that? And in many ways, that's where we are right now. We, we have these general guidance from the CDC, as Cameron rightly said, for the general population. But, but how do you apply it to the specifics of athletics or to, to the specifics of fans and, 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 and one uh, scenario versus another? And, and really, literally, what it is right now is we're all meeting like several times a week. And we sit down and we talk about it. We look at what's out there. We look at the evidence that's coming out. And then we say, well, how do we make this apply to th this situation? And, and it's very much how medicine is very often practiced. And, um, and, and we're in a pandemic. We haven't seen something like this in, in 100 years. And, and so we're all inventing this as, as we're speaking. And we're not just you know, pulling things out of our pocket. We're looking very, very carefully at the evidence. But even to that point, you know, testing three times a week versus testing every day. So we, we look at that and we look at the mathematical modeling of testing three times a week if you're using a PCR test versus an antigen test. And do they start equalizing if you're on a, a cadence where you're doing very, very regular testing? Well, we, we think that it does. And so, you know, we, we, we come to a consensus and, and that consensus may change in a month. That's what everyone needs to understand. We're, we're, we're working very hard. We don't know the best answer, but it's much better to really proceed as we have been doing, which is an imperfect start and an imperfect journey, than waiting for all the answers and we're sitting here in a perfect pause. Because like in all of society, we just can't do a perfect pause because that has massive public health implications as well. And sport, which is a, you know, we have to emphasize sport is a critically important aspect of culture, who we are as human beings. And, 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 and we need to do the best we can with sport because we don't have all the answers in, in sport for not just from an infectious disease point of view, but from many different points of view. But as long as we're all going in with good intent, we have a good sense that we're really doing a good thing for the athletes, that we're creating a, a safe environment, that's how we proceed. And, and that's really what public health is about as well. But Dr. O'Neill, what are the chances that the 14-day contact tracing could be reduced if you are testing every day, every other day, negative? I think that the chances of the 14-day quarantine period changing as we know more are decent. And I think that we've seen in this pandemic a, a little bit of an irritation and a frustration with changing guidance, but changes are progress. In medicine, for as long as we've practiced medicine, when we find out that what we were doing before wasn't the right way, we call that progress. We all celebrate it and we say, thank goodness, now we can treat our patients better. And we need to view the things that we're learning in this pandemic the same way. As these changes come, it's because we've learned more and that's progress. And I think that we've never had a respiratory virus in which we felt like 
14 days was the appropriate quarantine, but we did see people in this pandemic who developed symptoms very late. And that was shocking to us. And so we're, we're being very safe for our population. It wouldn't surprise me though, if ultimately the evidence showed that we can shorten quarantine and, and hopefully athletics being so heavily tested and being able to give that information um, to our local and, and state public health departments and ultimately to the CDC will help to advance our knowledge of quarantine and possibly get us out earlier, but only because of progress and because we've learned more information we can use in a good way. Dr. Wolf? No, I completely agree with Katie. I think 14 days was a great conservative and safe place to begin where we knew um, we knew extrapolated data from previous coronaviruses actually sort of led us to that point way back at the start of the year. But I, I totally agree. As we get more data, as we're prepared to share that data and the sort of follow the standard academic medical pathway of, of, of demonstrating that data to colleagues and sharing it around, then I think we shall, we, we shall adjust and we should try and figure out what the right length of time is. I'll bet it's shorter than 14 days. We need a bit more data to confirm that. Dr. Hainline, the flu vaccine, um, we can't make people get it. Uh, it seems like in the Southern Hemisphere, the flu was not as bad. Maybe it's because more people were masking uh, and social di socially distanced and, so and weren't traveling as much. And so maybe there wasn't as much virus in terms of that flu virus uh, being transmitted from person to person. But how do we get the college athlete, college population um, to get this flu vaccine over the next couple of weeks here before it's too late to at least mitigate that aspect. You mean sort of mandatory, like measles, mumps, rubella, meningococcus, and those other vaccines that are uh, highly effective? Um, yes. You know, I, I think we go on a campaign, and and and, but the student athletes have to be a big part of this campaign. They have to be the leaders, and and it's almost like a a badge of honor that they want to make sure everyone's getting the vaccine because again, it's one other thing that's going to protect the team. And by protecting the team, you're protecting those around the team, and and it becomes a societal matter. You know, I mean, it, 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 I think the the student athletes and you know they're they're very proud of of what they've been doing. I mean, yes, they they want to go out and you know they love to compete. All all athletes love to compete, but but I think you know it, there is a pride in and and that they're taking a leadership role. And so we put it to the athletes with the coaches hey, this would be another great way to show to society that the athletes are doing things right. And, you know, it gets to a, another matter that, that, you know, the athletic world is really behaving in a, in, you know, very close to a model manner. And, and at least the data we have, the infections are not happening by participating in athletics. It's happening outside of athletics. And so, you know, it becomes another example, all the athletes getting the flu vaccine, that becomes really a model for what all students, really, I think everyone on this show would agree, should be doing. Totally. Uh, either Doc, you want to add to the flu vaccine aspect? Uh, I mean, Brian summed that up beautifully. I mean, I think there's a great opportunity here to lead from example. I think it avoids all sorts of awkward scenarios that we might face if people present with symptoms that I, as a clinician, can't differentiate up front what's COVID and what's flu. They'll feel the same for the average 18, 20, 22 year old. Um, you know, I don't want to have to put athletes through precautionary quarantine thinking it's COVID and then finding it's flu. And there's just lots of sort of issues that that can bubble up when you, you talk, someone mentioned the word sort of twin demics of getting flu and COVID together. Um, I think many of those can be avoided. And I think your example of the Southern Hemisphere was spot on. They did a good job of mitigating distancing and masking. And in fact, they had the quietest flu season they've had in decades. I'd love to be able to emulate that. Dr. O'Neill? I agree. And I think, you know, we've tried to enforce on our campuses and for our primary schools is uh, we are so attuned to a cough, a sneeze, even the slightest symptom, and you're going home and you're going to get ruled out for COVID. And so one way to keep from being caught up in this, do I have flu or do I have COVID, is to get your flu vaccination so that you can, you can be protected from the one thing we can protect you from and that keeps you in school, keeps your close contact safe. It, it puts everybody, we just, we want to proceed through life in as normal a way as possible. And getting the flu vaccination is one of the ways that we can do that now. We should, we should be ready to embrace it. All right, so I want to come back uh, before we end here, full circle. Let's assume we have a vaccine or multiple choices of a vaccine sometime 
uh, available, you know, hopefully sometime in the second quarter of 21, which would be somewhere between that March and June range. Um, how do all three of you, uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. O'Neill, how do you envision that happening in terms of, and I know you're not in the logistic world, but how would you see it being administered to college students, college athletes, if it is available during their time on campus? We've already seen the, um, the federal government uh, discuss administration through Operation Warp Speed and, and let me say distribution through Operation Warp Speed and um, the use of the military. In the medical field, we've seen the distribution of new drugs like remdesivir. Um, they come through the federal government to your state health departments, then to your local health departments, and then it's really up to the local health department to decide how to distribute that. What we're seeing with the vaccine already is that as healthcare providers, we are deciding now when we get vaccine, how will we distribute that? And, you know, this pandemic has been great for community awareness and community um, togetherness. So we have a community medical task force. We, we're already talking about when we get the vaccine in region two of the state of Louisiana, how are we going to distribute what we have? So I, I think that those plans, um, as hard as they sound, but in six months into pandemic, that's actually the easy thing. We're gonna figure out how to distribute the vaccine and our big hurdle is going to be convincing people to get it. Um, and so that's what we're really focusing on, not the distribution, but the convincing people to get a safe and effective vaccine. Yes, trust will be major. I'm just trying to visualize this, Dr. Wolf. I mean, uh, how would this look? Would it be, you know, mile long cars driving up through a, is it everyone at, at uh, you know, coming into the football stadium? Um, I mean, how, how would this look in terms of everyone lining up, hopefully to get it in their arm? It's a, that's actually a great question because w the way we often do mass flu vaccines, uh, vaccine campaigns is you pile people through in these large conveyor belts. In fact, that's also a pretty good way of transmitting COVID. So you've got, you've got to be able to design a vaccination program that in fact still keeps people spaced, still keeps people masked, times the flow of getting them in. If it's a two-dose vaccine, arranges for them to come back on their second dose a month later. Um, but just like Katie, we're already in, in, in quite advanced discussions with our county and with our state to sort of say, right, let's prioritize within our hospital. Let's look at our university and think of all the people who'd be at high risk. Where do students fit into that pecking order? Um, and often I think if, I, I mean, I'd put it to athletic groups that if, if your athletic team and your university have not been in those discussions already, now would be a good time to start asking amongst your campus to say, look, where do we fit into this pecking order? What's it going to start to look like? Um, and even though this may be in 2021, there, there's, there's no preparation that's too early, I think, to think about logistics there. So Dr. Hanlon, I want to give you the last word that um, I guess I just assume that the student athlete population would take it, but it's probably wrong of me to do that when we talk about this lack of trust in vaccines and a certain anti-vaxxer group. I mean, you know, I know we already heard this little early controversy with Novak Djokovic, whether or not he was anti-vaxxer or not, you know, so clearly some athletes aren't a fan of it. Um, how do we build that trust within the athletic, college athletic community of saying, this is going to be, you know, a, a shorter time period of getting you back into a semi-normal situation on the field of play if you take this vaccine and all of us do within this community? You know, I think in some ways, uh, COVID has really shifted the trust factor um, with student athletes because they understand how uh, most of them, how serious this is. And when you have people like Cameron and Katie on the ground and they're working with the athletes and, and there's just this natural trust that, that these two individuals and you take Cameron and Katie and multiply it a hundredfold across all the NCAA member schools, the, the boots on the ground physicians and athletic trainers who have been working overtime and, and doing so much so that we can roll out sports safely. I think that by the time when a vaccine comes around that there's gonna be a, a tremendous trust factor. And in fact, it, it's already there. And, and so I'm less concerned about that and, and, and more concerned about the logistics and agree completely that, that we should be already developing the log logistic plans. And, and we may take our cues. There will be some schools that will do it well. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going back to when we roll out, uh, you know, we're still in the midst of this 
NCAA Department of Defense massive concussion study. And, and with Air Force and West Point, they were able to do a, a complete concussion assessment on every single one of their cadets in two days. Well, how did they do it? They just developed a protocol and they went through it. And, and you know, there will be best practices, ways to do it, but um, we start developing the protocols now and we start circulating that. And, and I agree 100%. Let's start planning for that now because it's not too far away. Well, Ty, I feel like I took a master class here uh, during the Zoom call. I really appreciate the two of you. Learned a lot, uh, and uh, you've both got incredible bedside manner, a very calming tone, and and educating us in, in terms of what has happened, what lies ahead, and hopefully the tools that we'll all adhere to to get through this pandemic. Um, Dr. Catherine O'Neill from LSU, Dr. Cameron Wolf from Duke. Uh, appreciate you both. Thank you, and Dr. Brian Hainline, as always, uh, my uh, co-pilot here on our NCAA Social Series. You can go to ncaa.org slash social series, where all 29 of our episodes are archived. We're going to be on this topic like no one else in college athletics since the beginning, all the way back in March. We will talk again next week. Stay safe, everyone.